Well, welcome everybody. I'm Tim from Fontenelle Forest. I apologize if you tuned in earlier to see this on Facebook Live. Uh, there were some technical difficulties and I wasn't able to connect to Facebook Live. Um, so I'm just recording this program um, and we will get it posted out on Facebook and YouTube. Um, so hopefully you're watching it there. So again, I'm Tim from Fontenelle Forest. Welcome to another edition of our Understanding Nature series. Um, and today is um, the first day of autumn. It's September 22nd, and that makes it the, the uh, autumnal equinox. So at the equator today, there are 12 hours of daylight, 12 hours of, of night. Um, here in Nebraska, not quite equal yet. Um, I think that doesn't happen for us for another couple of days, but officially this is the first day of fall. So I'm coming to you live from the, the autumn forest, well, Okay, full disclosure, I'm coming to you live from my basement, but the background behind me is the, is the autumn forest. So it's starting to feel a little more like autumn. It's starting to, you know, the days are getting shorter, the, the nights are getting cooler. The days are even getting cooler, which is kind of nice. Um, and that means it's time for some of our animals to start thinking about how they're gonna get through the winter. Uh, now, some of our animals stick around, right? They, they are active all winter. You see squirrels, you see a lot of birds. Um, some animals will, you know, they'll migrate. So the geese are starting to fly, um, ducks, things like that, they're starting to fly south. And that's not because they're afraid of the cold. That's some, some people think that, you know, animals hibernate or they, they migrate because, because they can't handle the cold. But if you think about a lot of our birds that stick around, um, during the winter months. Um, some of our smaller birds like nuthatches and chickadees, I mean, they're tiny little birds and they make it through even those coldest winter days. Um, so really what it is about winter time that, that causes our animals to hibernate or to do something else is not the cold, but it's a lack of food. So if you think about the birds that fly south, what are they? They're, they're waterfowl, they're geese, they're ducks. What do they need? They need open water. So actually geese, um, a lot of times if there's open water during the winter, the geese won't, won't fly very far south. They might stick around all winter if they have open water. Um, so it's, it's that lack of food. Um, other birds that fly south are, or migrate are gonna be hummingbirds. Think about hummingbirds, what do they eat? They eat pollen and nectar. We don't have a lot of that during the winter. Um, other birds uh, eat insects. Not a lot of those happen around during the winter. So they have to choose some of these or they've evolved um, these other strategies. So we're not going to talk about our migratory species. We're going to talk about our species that, that kind of sleep the winter away to a certain extent. So these animals have different ways of getting through the winter. So there's, there's torpor, Torpor and true hibernation are very similar. Um, torpor is kind of like hibernation light. It's, it's the difference between um, if true hibernation is you know, a good eight hours night sleep, then torpor is just kind of that light nap during the day. Um, diapause is actually what we call it in insects. So insects go into what's called diapause. And brumation, is what we call it in our, in our amphibians and reptiles. So it's, it's similar to hibernation, but there, it's, not, it's not exactly the same. And we're gonna talk about each one of these. So animals that are warm-blooded, or what we call endothermic, will use hibernation or, or torpor. Like I said, torpor is an alternative to full hibernation, and that's to help them get through the cold winter. And again, it's not the cold, that they can't survive, it's the lack of food. So all of the animals that use torpor, torpor and hibernation are animals that would not be able to get enough food during the winter to survive. You use a lot more energy keeping warm. That high body temperature of us warm-blooded animals means that we, we burn more calories in the winter trying to, trying to stay warm and keep our body temperature up. So those animals would not be able to get enough food during the winter in order to survive. So some examples, um, bats, and bats again eat insects, so they need to go into torpor or hibernation during the winter. Bears, 
Bears eat a lot of berries, um, grubs, things like that. Uh, skunks, raccoons, woodchucks, chipmunks, those kinds of animals. So sometimes we characterize hibernation and torpor as a long sleep, but it's, it's, very, it's actually very different than sleeping. Um, in torpor and hibernation, animals lower their metabolic rate, so their heart rate drops, their body temperature drops, um, their breathing is reduced, and all of this means they're burning fewer calories. They don't need to have as much food. Now there's a couple of different types of, of uh, hibernation. Um, one is called predictive dormancy. So predictive dormancy means that as the days get shorter, animals are triggered to go into these hibernative states or they're triggered to get ready for it. So cold-blooded animals, they need to anticipate that cold weather. They can't wait until it's super cold to, to start burying themselves underground where they're, gonna, where they're not gonna freeze. They need, they need something that comes before that cold weather to trigger them, and that's those shorter daylight. So that would, as the days get shorter, then they know, oh, the days are getting shorter, it's gonna start getting cold, I need to bury myself where I'm not gonna freeze to death. So if the cold snap happens before they're ready, then they might have some issues. And that's, that's true for our, our warm-blooded animals too, like our, our woodchuck here or bears. What do they start doing as the days get shorter? Well, they start packing on that, that body fat, that fat that they're gonna need to survive without eating all winter long. And again, that's a response to those shorter day lengths. That's a response to reduced daylight. The other type of dormancy is called consequential dormancy. And those are, the, those are the animals that they don't hibernate until they're exposed to a, a significantly cold um, weather environment. So once it gets cold, and we're gonna talk about ladybugs, their threshold is 55 degrees. When it starts to get below 55 degrees, they're kind of triggered to start going into that, that, um, that hibernative state, diapause. So let's talk about some of our animals that experience torpor or that short-term hibernation light. So bears. Now that might surprise a lot of people because usually when you think of bears, you think of hibernation. They're, they're well known to hibernate, but actually they, they really actually go into a state of torpor. So their heart rate and respiration drops. Their body temperature only drops by about five to 10 degrees, which is different from other true hibernators. True hibernators will have their body temperature will drop down um, as low as about 35, 35 degrees. So they can go days without eating and drinking, the bears can. And their, their bodies are actually adapted so that when they go into this state of torpor, their bodies will recycle proteins and urine. And that lets them go for a long time without urinating or drinking. And, and it lets them avoid um, muscle atrophy. But if we get some warmer days, there's some warmer days they might be out um, roaming around. They might get some, eat some snow to, to replenish some of those fluids. So not, not quite true hibernators. Um, possums, <coughs> excuse me. Possum, I think possums are neat. Possums are North America's only marsupial. A marsupial, they have a pouch like a kangaroo. So when the young are born, they make their way to that pouch and they, they latch onto a nipple and they develop there for a little bit. <coughs> now, Possums may venture out in the winter, but they're, they're very susceptible. They have that bald tail and those feet, they're very susceptible to frostbite on their tails and feet. So they don't like to go out in the winter if it's too cold. Now, most people, a lot of people don't like possums because they're not the cutest animal that we have. They do have the most teeth, which makes them look scary. They have 50 teeth in their mouth. So they have the most teeth of any mammal. But the cool thing about possums is that they're, they're actually, res they're very good. They're very good to have around. They're resistant to rabies. So you never have to worry about being attacked by a rabid possum because they generally don't get rabies. Um, they're, re they're resistant to snake venom. 
So they, they've actually used possums as a means to make um, anti-venom for certain snakes. And they eat ticks, that's my favorite thing. I, I like a lot of nature, I don't like ticks. I think ticks are disgusting. But they eat ticks, they can eat in two to three months um, during the summertime, they can eat up to about 5,000 ticks. So they are welcome to come around my yard and eat as many ticks as they can stomach. Um, they'll also eat insects, they'll eat snakes, they'll eat mice, so they'll help keep those mice out of your house. So they're really kind of neat. They're neat little animals. And I actually got to see one. I had one uh, right in front of my house the other night running around. Now our friend the raccoon, or what my children call trash pandas, because they are, they may, and they, they use torpor during the winter. They might forage, if we get some warmer days, they might come out and forage around. Um, but generally they kind of kind of just huddle up in their their hollow tree and they they kind of sleep the sleep the cold days away. <clears throat> now you might see them out around the end of January, beginning of February. That's the beginning of raccoon mating season. So you might see them out um, towards the end of winter. But for the most part during the winter, they're gonna they're gonna kind of stay huddled up in that in that den of theirs. So like I said, torpor is kind of hibernation light. Um, so true hibernation is a state of inactivity. Um, and again, it's brought about, it's triggered by those shorter day lengths, um, cold temperatures, which just kind of go along with shorter day lengths. And, but really it's those limitations of food as the reason for, for hibernation. So it's triggered by shorter day lengths, but the reason is because food is gonna be limited and it's a type of dormancy. So in true hibernators, their metabolism is gonna drop very low. So breathing is gonna go down, heart rate and body temperature all drop to very, very low levels. So let's look at some of our true hibernators. Bats. So this makes sense. Bats eat insects. For the most part, the ones in Nebraska do anyway. Some bats eat fruit, but not the ones that are native to Nebraska. Um, so they need to they need to get through the winter somehow. They're they're not strong enough flyers to. They're very agile flyers, but they're not gonna they're not gonna migrate. That would that would be a, a lot of effort for them. So depending on the species and the location, some bats will go into torpor. Um, some bats will hibernate. Um, sometimes they. Sometimes they gather together, depending on the species. They might um, all gather together in a cave or um, your attic sometimes, um, sad but true. Um, some will just go into a state of torpor and sometimes they do this individually. So their heart rate will drop from about 400 beats a minute to about 10. And they might not take a breath except once every hour. So, they might roost in your attic, which if you have a lot of bats around, you probably don't want. And bats are cool. They can eat, you know, 600 mosquitoes in a single night, which again, along with the possums, they're welcome around my house. I have, I had three this summer that were, were frequent nighttime visitors to our house. They were welcome to eat all the, in, all the mosquitoes they wanted. Um, so if you don't want them in your attic, you might want to think about putting up a bat house if you have a lot of bats around and that'll give them a place to roost. And you can, you can buy these commercially um, on Amazon. You can find plans online if you're, if you're good with woodworking. Now, most of the time we think of birds as, as migrating. You know, most of our birds either migrate to Southern climates or they stick around. There's not a lot of in between. Some will, some will a handful use torpor, um, but there's only one that's known to hibernate, and it's actually a, a native bird to Nebraska, and that's the, the whippoorwill. So rather than migrate, because they're an insect eating bird, they will snuggle into a hollow log and they'll wait out the winter um, by hibernating. And here's what they sound like, they're really neat. So they, they kind of say their own name, whippoorwill, whippoorwill, whippoorwill. And I've heard those at Fontenelle Forest, so they are around. 
Now they, they might also hibernate if it gets too hot and they hibernate sometimes um, when food is scarce and while incubating eggs. So that's, you know, if you, you got to sit on the nest anyways, you might as well take a nap, I guess. So their temperature goes down um, to about 40 degrees and they'll, they'll reduce their respiration rate by about 90% when they're in this, this hibernative state. Ground squirrels. Now, obviously not our tree squirrels. We see uh, our fox squirrels and our red squirrels and gray squirrels running around all winter long, right? Getting into your bird feeder, um, scampering around up the trees. But our ground squirrels, if you think about it, they live underground. So a lot of times their, their dens, their burrows are going to be covered by a couple feet of snow, depending on how much snow we get. And they are, you know, they eat grass and vegetation. So that's all going to be buried under the snow. So they go into hibernation. And ground squirrels actually, as the days get shorter, it triggers a change in their blood chemistry. And it's that change in their blood chemistry that actually then triggers them to go into hibernation. Scientists actually took blood from a hibernating ground squirrel, injected it into an active ground squirrel, and triggered that ground squirrel, the active one, in, into hibernation. So it's that change in blood chemistry. Now, one of, our, one of our largest species of ground squirrels is our woodchuck, also known as a groundhog, also known by my one of my favorite nicknames, the whistle pig, because when they sense danger, they'll sit up and they'll make kind of a whistling noise. Now, woodchucks have a summer den and a winter den. So in the summer, they den out in the open. They like a big open field um, where they can, you know, run around and eat. But they're in the winter time, as the days get shorter, actually in the fall, right about soon, they usually start um, hibernating in October. So right now our woodchucks are probably seeking out their, a good spot for their winter den. Their winter den, they like someplace that's more brushy, more wooded. And they'll dig down, um, try and get below the frost line. So at least, uh, at least you know, a foot and a half, two feet underground. And they dig different chambers. So they'll have a sleeping chamber and woodchucks, you know, being tidy creatures, say what you will about a woodchuck. I know a lot of people don't like them in their garden, but they actually build a separate chamber in their den just for going to the bathroom. So they have a bathroom chamber. Now, right about this time of year, they're, they're probably, they might be getting into your garden because they need to pack on the pounds. They get up to about 13 pounds before they go into hibernation. And they'll lose about half of that weight during the winter time as they, as they hibernate. So they go into hibernation in October. Their body temperature will go down to about 35 degrees. Um, their heart rate will drop to somewhere between 4 and 10 beats per minute. And they'll take a breath about once every six minutes. So at the end, around the end of February, um, they'll... Uh, the males will actually come out of hibernation first around the end of February and they'll go out and survey their territory. And what they're doing is they'll go out and, and make sure all the female woodchucks are, are in their dens where they left them. That way they know. Then they go back to bed for a month because the female woodchucks aren't dumb. They, they are not getting up until it's warm out, until that snow is really gone. So that's our woodchuck. Now we believe that, you know, Every February 2nd on Groundhog Day, we pull one out, and if it sees its shadow, um, you know, we think there's going to be six more weeks of winter. It turns out that the groundhog is not very good at predicting um, six more weeks of winter. He's actually wrong more often than he's right. Now, Groundhog Day is actually based on an old English holiday, um, and that was based on the hedgehog. So obviously we don't have hedgehogs in Nebraska, but the hedgehog is a champion hibernator. So some of the, they are one of the deepest hibernators in the world. So they have, they actually have special cells in their body that help keep them warm. They release heat 20 times faster than a normal white cell in other hibernators. Now another animal that's obviously not native 
to Nebraska, these are, these are native to Madagascar, is the fat-tailed dwarf lemur. And I bring it up because it's kind of unique. So the fat-tailed dwarf lemur is the only primate known to hibernate. And they, they can hibernate up to seven months. Now they feed on fruit. So where they live, they have a wet season where fruit is plentiful, and then they have a dry season where there's no fruit. So they, they hibernate during that dry season. So while fruit is plentiful, they will, they will eat as much of it as they can and they'll, they'll pack the fat into this tail. And this tail, by the time they're done, will make up about 40% of their body weight. And then as, when the dry season hits and there's no more fruit to eat, they go into hibernation. Their heart rate will drop from 180 beats a minute uh, down to about four and their respiration rate will, dr will drop to one breath every 10 to 15 minutes. So that's pretty impressive. And their body temperature becomes um, the ambient, whatever the ambient air temperature is. Now where they live, <coughs> excuse me, where they live, and this is why, like I said before, this is kind of an example of how it's not the cold weather that's the problem because the average temperature during that dry season where they live is about 80 degrees. So that's the average high temperature. So their body temperature will drop down to uh, you know, a, a whopping 80 degrees, but still they hibernate because they're, they're getting through that, that season where there's not a lot of food to eat. Now let's talk about our cold-blooded or what we call ectothermic animals. Now they use diapause or brumation. Diapause is, is what we call it in insects. Brumation is what we call it in reptiles and amphibians. So their body temperature is the same as the ambient air temperature. So diapause is just a pause in development. So if, if a, an insect um, is an adult already, they will survive the winter as an adult. If they're a larva and during warm months, it would take you know, three months for them to transform into an adult. During the winter, that's just put on pause and they'll remain a larva throughout the winter and they'll resume that development when warmer weather returns. Um, brumation is used by reptiles and amphibians. It's similar to hibernation. Um, it's still oftentimes triggered, not always, but oftentimes triggered by those shorter day lengths. So those animals have time to get ready. But really it's the, the slowdown in their metabolism has more to do with the ambient air temperature because as, that, as the weather gets cold, they slow down. So this is a familiar one, right? It, ladybugs. So ladybugs, as the weather gets colder, they'll start to gather. Oftentimes they gather together um, and they'll get under, under uh, rotten logs, under leaf litter, um, in cracks, places like that. And th this is one of our, our consequential dormancy animals. So consequential dormancy, if you recall, they don't go into hibernation until they're exposed to cold weather. And like I said, ladybugs have a threshold of about 55 degrees. So they'll start to, they'll start to uh, go into that diapause. Now I remember last, uh, this last fall, or yeah, last fall, a year ago, um, we had a, a cold snap. We had a, a weekend where it was um, about 80 degrees one day, and I had all kinds of ladybugs out on the front of my house. And the next day, the weather turned on a dime, and, and I think it got down into the, the high 30s, low 40s. And I, I had a whole bunch of dead ladybugs on the front of my house. So that's that risk of consequential dormancy. If that cold snap happens too quickly, if it's not gradual, well, then you can, get, you can get caught out and it can cause, cause injury or death. So in, in a lot of other uh, insects, it's that, again, it's that daylight length that triggers them to get ready for, for this diapause. So bumblebees. So this is kind of the life cycle of a bumblebee. Now, if you're gonna be a bumblebee, be the queen bee. So the queen bee is actually the only one that hibernates. So, she emerges in the spring, she goes out and forages, and then she'll lay eggs, and she lays fertilized eggs with, with 
uh, sperm that she stored from the year before. So she stores that sperm all winter long and then she lays fertilized eggs in the spring. And those fertilized eggs are all going to develop into female worker bees. So as when those female worker bees, when they hatch um, as larvae and then they, they uh, metamorph into adults, they take over. Once they take over the foraging duties, the queen stays in the nest. So at the end of summer, beginning of fall, the queen's going to start to lay unfertilized eggs. Now that sounds like an oxymoron, but unfertilized eggs develop into male bees. And she lays some more fertilized eggs that are going to develop into new queens. So the, the new queens and the males will, will leave the nest. They'll mate. The new queens are going to go into hibernation. They're going to they're gonna establish a, a burrow. Usually bumblebees uh, nest in the ground. They're going to establish a burrow and they're going to go into hibernation. All the male bees, all the female worker bees, the cold is going to kill them off. And it's only the females that overwinter. Spiders. Now I know most people would wish that the spiders would just die out during the winter. Not me. I love my spiders. But spiders usually lay eggs in autumn and the spiderlings will actually hatch during the autumn and they'll overwinter generally in the egg sac. So spiders may also weave a web, like build, build themselves almost like a cocoon um, in a crack or under loose bark and that helps them survive the winter. Because what spiders will do is they'll start to replace all the fluid in their cells um, with a natural antifreeze called glycol. Now, a lot of times if you see a spider, if it's cold out and you find a spider in your house or during the winter time, you find a spider in your house, we, we usually think, oh, they must have come in seeking warmth. And that's not the case. Spiders actually won't come in seeking warmth. They're adapted to survive the winter. So if there's a spider in your house in December or January, got bad news for you. That spider's been there the whole time. It's just you didn't see it before. So either, and, and if you throw it outside, it's going to die. So, yeah, so there's that. But yeah, they don't, they don't come seeking warmth inside. That, that's a myth. So let's talk about brumation. So again, brumation is the reptile version of hibernation. Um, garter snakes, like what we have here, they'll gather together. Oftentimes they'll gather in dens. Rattlesnakes do this too. They'll gather together during the winter, which helps them, um, helps them survive. They kind of can share what little body heat they have. Now up in Manitoba in Canada, there's a place called the Narcisse Snake Dens. Now the Narcisse Snake Dens is the greatest concentration of snakes on the planet. And these are red-sided garter snakes. They're not, they're not venomous. They're not dangerous at all. But up there, there are these limestone caverns. There's all this limestone. Um, and so the snakes in the autumn will, will migrate in and they'll all gather together. It's actually a, a big tourist attraction. They'll gather in the fall and they'll go into brumation. So in, there's about 75,000 red-sided garter snakes that brumate together in this area. Now in the springtime, they all come out. And again, it's another tourist attraction to come, come see the, the snakes as they emerge from hibernation. So the males will come out first and they'll wait for the females. Now I learned something that I find fascinating about these snakes. So, Snakes, like a lot of things, produce pheromones. And there's a male pheromone and there's a female pheromone. Now some, not all, but some of the male snakes can produce both types of pheromones. So in the spring, when they're cold, they come out and some of these male snakes will start putting out a female pheromone. And the reason for that is that they're tricking the other males. Those other males will sense that female pheromone and they'll come gather around and they'll attempt to mate with that male that's producing the pheromone. Now what that does is it allows that male producing the pheromone to steal the body heat from the other snakes. It's actually called kleptothermy. 
which I love that there's a name for because my children and my wife do this to me all the time when they're cold. They, they come and steal my body heat. They, it's kleptothermy. They have a name for it. And I just think that's really, really cool that they actually trick other males into coming over and warming them up because that gives them an advantage because now they're, they're nice and warm. And when you're a, a reptile and you're warm, then you can be more active. And so that gives them a better chance then of mating with a female because they're more active than the males that they've now slowed down by stealing their body heat. Now, again, not native to Nebraska is the Gila monster. One of two venomous lizards in the world, they get up to about a foot and they live in the desert Southwest, but they, they again, they brumate. So when it gets cold, they go into brumation. Um, from November-ish to about February-ish, um, they will brumate there in the desert southwest. Now frogs. Frogs are pretty cool and frogs have some amazing tricks. So aquatic frogs, um, like our leopard frogs and bullfrogs, um, they'll stay in the water. They'll actually uh, remain underwater, burrow into the mud. Sometimes they just swim around, they just slow way down so that they're under the ice near the bottom. Um, bullfrogs, actually their tadpoles will overwinter and in places where it's warm, they develop much faster. Um, places where the water stays cold year round, um, those tadpoles actually take up to three, three to five years before they actually develop into adult, pro into adult frogs. Now tree frogs, and we have a lot of tree frogs in Nebraska, they actually do something really cool. They actually will, they don't, they can't burrow. So they'll get under a tree bark or they'll, you know, find a, a crack in the rocks or someplace like that where they can get as, as deep as they possibly can. But what they'll do is as it gets colder, their body starts to store urine in their blood. And what this does is kind of like the spider. It makes a natural antifreeze. So, these frogs, as it gets colder, will actually freeze almost solid. They'll freeze about 60% of the way. And because they've stored this anti antifreeze, because normally if you just have water in your cells and it freezes, the, the shape of the crystal will burst the cell. And that's how you get frostbite. But with this antifreeze, it can freeze solid without bursting the, bursting the walls of the cell. So they can actually freeze solid, their heart will stop, their breathing will stop. For all intents and purposes, they are no longer alive. And then in the spring, when they thaw out, their heart starts beating, they start to breathe again. Um, and they, they basically come back to life. And so that's got some pretty impressive implications um, as it applies to humans. Um, they, they're actually, uh, there's, some people that believe in what's called cryogenics, they've actually had themselves frozen um, with, the, with the double intent that whatever killed them would be cured. Usually it's, it's uh, people who had um, had a disease for which we didn't have a cure. So they've been frozen anticipating that sometime in the future um, there will be a cure for that disease. Now the, the other problem with cryogenics right now is we haven't figured out how to bring people back to life from that frozen state. So they got to figure out that problem too before any of these people, I think there's um, somewhere between two and 600 people in the United States that have been cryogenically frozen. But if we can figure that out, it also has some pretty interesting applications for deep space travel. You think about um, traveling to other planets that are, that are many, 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 many years um, away by our by a spaceship, you know, not like science fiction. And cryogenics in science fiction movies, they do that all the time. They put people into hypersleep. Um, and that's basically what that is. So if we can figure that out, uh, it does have some interesting applications. Now the last critter I want to talk about today as it applies to, to brumation is turtles, because turtles have some some pretty cool things too. So box turtles will burrow into the ground. <coughs> and this is our ornate box turtle. Um, snapping turtles and painted turtles, like you see here on the left, they will actually overwinter under the ice. Now think about that. Turtles don't have gills. Turtles have lungs. 
They breathe air. They normally you see a turtle, you know, poking its nose above the water to get a breath of air. But they can overwinter under the ice. And the reason for that is because they can slow, they slow down so much that they don't have to breathe. They can survive on the oxygen that they can absorb through their skin. So what this is called is cloacal respiration. So the cloaca is the, the opening that our turtles have and other animals have. Um, and it's kind of a, that's where they lay eggs, it's where they poop, it's, it's all that kind of stuff. So they just have one opening. So cloacal rep respiration, which is a mouthful to say, is a lot less fun than saying butt breathing. They breathe through their butts. That's how they get enough oxygen is through their butts and they can survive under the ice. Now, um, these turtles under the ice have another problem to contend with. As the winter wears on, the oxygen level of the water is gonna decrease because there's still fish, there's still um, other turtles, amphibians, there's things using it and the plants aren't producing any new oxygen. So that, that oxygen level drops. And so they, they will actually, at some point during the winter, their, their metabolism switches from aerobic, which is using oxygen, to anaerobic. Now, the problem with anaerobic respiration is it builds up lactic acid. So if you've, if you've gone running or biking or done something strenuous, your heart rate goes up, um, your muscles start to burn, and that burn is the lactic acid building up, and you breathe more and your, your heart rate pumps more to flush the, that lactic acid out. Well, they can't do that under the ice. So some of our, some of our turtles actually can neutralize some of that lactic acid um, by borrowing by borrowing calcium from their shell. So when I have here a shell from a, this is a, an Eastern box turtle shell, and you can see this shell is made of bone. So they can borrow some of the calcium from this shell to buffer some of that lactic acid, kind of like taking Tums, and that helps them survive um, during that time. So pretty cool stuff. Um, if you have any questions, um, feel free to post them. Um, if we get this up on Facebook, you can post them under the, under the video. Uh, if you want information on upcoming programs from Fontenelle Forest or you want to become a member, please visit our website, fontenelleforest.org. Um, if you'd like to book a program similar to this one for, for your own small group, uh, please you know, get a hold of me. Here's my, this is my name. Um, that's my number at the forest and my email address. Email is usually the best, best way to get a hold of me. Um, and lastly, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Um, because of COVID, we weren't able to hold our annual fundraiser. And these are some of the companies and people that I generously gave um, and allowed us to keep, keep doing our mission, even, even though it became a little more difficult. All right, thanks again. Have a good day, stay healthy, and we will see you next time.